welcome. This- nope, let me do it. You shut your mouth. <laughs> no, you're better at it. Do you want to do it? Nope, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> welcome. This is Creatures of the Night podcast, and I am Wendy. I am Chris. There. So if that sounded horrible, it's because Chris forced me to do that. (laughs) I had a gun to her head. I'm just going to cut out the part where I told you to shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So thanks so much for joining us, guys. (laughs) We're just here torturing each other over our podcast. Don't mind us. So this is the episode that will release the Monday after Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day being on a Friday. So I'm sure so many people will have spent their weekend drinking their feelings away after a failed day of romance. So thank you for joining us, you know, to lift your spirits. (laughs) Something uplifting and (laughs) ghostly. (laughs) Ghostly. (laughs) I personally, I don't know about you, but I personally do not care about Valentine's Day. I never have. Even when I was younger, I was still an old crabby lady at heart. And I could care less whether I had a date or got flowers on Valentine's Day. Just the pressure that this one silly day puts on people is what I despise. It's not that I'm not a fan of like romance or love. I mean, I've shared with you plenty of times my Outlander obsession on this podcast. (laughs) I've talked about it too. So yeah, I like love stories. I dig a good romance. It's maybe the only girly thing about me. (laughs) And I don't give a shit at all about it. It's not my thing. Have you, you've never been into it, right? I would assume. Yeah. I've never been into, like, honestly, even movies that make me cry, I'm like, I don't feel normal watching this. <laughs> Now that I am a big crybaby. I don't like other people seeing me cry though. So even oh. in my own house, in front of my own family, I'm like, <laughs> oh. and like hiding it. But I don't mind a good cry from a really like good movie. You got to flip that switch, Wendy. Next time something like that happens and they catch you crying, just go ugly crying. Just look at them and be like. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all can't see the face that Chris just made, but you don't want to either. So (laughs) just go all in. Just lean into it. That's all I'm saying. No, I just act like my eyes are watering and (laughs) just my allergies are kicking in right now. No, they know what a damn crybaby I am. And and the stupidest things get me too. I mean, like you don't watch this stuff, but like my kid, my youngest, he likes Fuller House, the like new spinoff of Full House and DJ and Steve in the last episode they got engaged I watched it like five times and I think I cried every single time it was so beautiful (laughs) (laughs) and then like another show you don't watch but shameless this couple Ian and Mickey is their names and they just got married I watched the scene of them getting married like a dozen times like in the middle of work I'm like I just need a little fix of love in my heart Oh, uh, see, you should have done the Valentine's Day episode. Here I am talking about witches and death, and you're like, love. <laughs> I'm such a stupid girl, and I don't like really sharing that with people, but it just so happens that the fifth season of Outlander starts February 16th. Wow. Or started, I guess. Yeah, right, this week. Right. So for the last couple of weeks, I've been watching old episodes, preparing for the new ones. So when I was trying to decide on a podcast story, I just couldn't get Scotland out of my head. It's all I've been watching, really. I discovered that you can take tours through Scotland that are strictly outlander locations wow (laughs) because they do film the show in scotland even now like the current seasons they're in america but they're still filming in scotland so they film at actual castles and estates and historical locations half the show is telling the true historical happenings of that period in time oh that's cool Yeah, so it's cool. It's a history lesson as well as the other half being a love story with some dirty sex scenes sprinkled in. Sprinkled in. Here and there, you might see some nudity, you know, and very vivid sex scenes or love scenes. That's what I Ah. meant to say. Love scenes. (laughs) Sure you did. Gotcha. Again, it makes me so embarrassed to admit that I like this show. But like I said, it's a history lesson as well. And I've always, like since I was a kid, been into history. In school, it was hands down my favorite subject. 
I hated history in school. What? They would tell you the most boring shit. They would not make it entertaining whatsoever. Science was my favorite because we got to do experiments. I'm like, yes, let's bring it. Turn on the nukes. Let's, <laughs> let's see what we can <laughs> blow up in this class. That is so interesting. Yeah, I love history. I absolutely do. I love everything about it. But in school, I was falling asleep every single time. I got a teacher that was always monotone. Yeah. And then I had to take that shit home and read it at home, too. I'm like, oh, you're killing me. It was just not my thing. I remember I had an economics teacher that he was, oh, wow, really monotone. But yeah. how can you make economics fun? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had an economics teacher that was a lot of fun. She was my marketing teacher, too. And I went to state championship with Shit. her. Shit. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't know that? No, that's why all our ads <laughs> for our podcasts are so amazing. I had no idea. Yeah, I did. I liked her a lot. And she liked me because obviously I was in school, you know, back in the 90s, you were a freak. You know, I had the long black hair. I wore Jinkos. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was in marketing. So in marketing, you had to wear the suits and stuff and you had to go and sell your stuff. It, that was a lot of fun. Whatever I could do to get out of class, I'm like, oh, all I have to do is like act professional. Done. I can wear a suit jacket. Let's go. Get on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you are hiding the fact that you love high heels because you can wear <laughs> the fuck out of them. That's so and funny. how much you love marketing because you are so good at it. I like marketing fine. I just don't like people. If I could just market with ghosts, that's why I'm into the paranormal, man. It's different. Yeah. I mean, like it's all on the internet now. So, I mean, you don't have to really socialize with people. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we don't want you to comment or email us, guys, creatures of the night, paranormal, gmail.com, you know. Like and subscribe. We do want to talk to you through the computer. <laughs> we love that form of discussion. I just don't want to put real pants on to have to go outside. No. <laughs> So yeah, don't know what grade, but I can remember I had a history teacher. I think it was world history. He was trying to get on Jeopardy. So yeah. he would have to like leave and go take calls in the middle of class because they were doing like interviews over the phone with him. Mm. And he was such a nerd for Jeopardy that he even had us play it in class like wow. to study before a test. Wow. And I killed it. <laughs> So I think this is what must have like awakened it in me is this fun ass teacher that was having us do shit and learn things mm. in a really fun way. Like he also taught us some origin stories of a few nursery rhymes, oh. which was really cool because uh. they connect it back to historical events. Though I have since found out that some of these stories are not exactly true. Take, for example, ring a ring of rosies, or I think we would know it as ring around the rosies. Many believe that this is about the Great Plague or Black Death because a rosy rash was said to be a symptom of the plague and posies of herbs were carried as protection to ward off the smell of disease or some people say they were put in the pockets of the deceased to hide the smell. Mm. Then the line ashes to ashes is in reference to cremating the bodies. But a lot of people today are saying that the rhyme is actually from pagan rituals are celebrations as dancing in circles and flowers and painting the body with whatever you can find such as ash from your fireplace had mm. long been pagan activities within rituals the dates of when the nursery rhyme appears match more so with that than of the plague but maybe my teacher wasn't allowed to teach paganism in <laughs> school i mean we did grow up in the south so yeah right that but another one he taught us about was Rockabye Baby, which was in regards to the Catholic King James II and the fears of the English that if he had a son, that this Catholic dynasty would continue. For like 150 years before this, England and their official church had been Protestant after that whole Henry VIII divorcing his wife to marry his mistress, you know. Well, King James II was Protestant and his first wife was as well, but his second wife was Catholic and he got way into her and he converted. And then he was all about pushing Catholicism back into England. But it wasn't until his new wife was said to be having a male heir that the country took action to dethrone the king and oh. put a stop to this whole shifting in religion. 
The nursery rhyme has a few different theories on what each line means, but what my history teacher had told us was that King James was becoming desperate for a Catholic heir. His other children, all female, were Protestant from the first wife. A male heir would trump them. It's not like that anymore, but back then it was. So he gathered up all the ladies working in his service that were pregnant. I'm assuming by him, but my history teacher didn't explain that. (laughs) And just whichever had a baby boy first, he was going to claim that was the baby that his wife had. Oh, wow. James's older daughter, Mary, and her husband, William the Orange, were like, nope, that's not happening. And William sailed to England and ran the king into exile. Mm. This son that King James II had was James Francis Edward Stuart, who some called the Old Pretender. <laughs> oh. Didn't the Foo Fighters write a song about him? Ooh, <laughs> did they? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, called, it's the Pretender, but no, it's not. <laughs> so he was called the Old Pretender because he spent so much of his time telling anyone that would listen that he was the true and rightful king of England, Ireland, and Scotland. His heir, Charles Edward Stuart, was known as the Bonnie Prince Charlie. And my story is on the Battle of Culloden Moor. Which is featured on my Outlander show, by the way. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's go back to the juicy stuff, guys. <laughs> no, no, this is all the history stuff for you. But the oh. only reason I know about any of this is because of that show. So Queen Anne, the last monarch of the House of Stuart, died in 1714 with no living children. Under the terms of the Act of Settlement of 1701, she was succeeded by her second cousin, George I, of the House of Hanover. On July 23rd, 1745, Charles Edward Stewart landed in Ariske, maybe, is how you say it? Ariske, what? <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah. in the Western Islands, and he landed there in an attempt to reclaim the throne of Great Britain for his exiled father, James. Most of his Scottish supporters advised he returned to France, but enough were eventually persuaded and the rebellion was launched. For Charles, the main prize was England. He argued removing the Hanoverians would guarantee an independent Scotland, which of course, that was going to intrigue most Scots as Scotland and England, they didn't have the best relationship. Yeah. Raising an army consisting mostly of Scottish clansmen, along with smaller units of Irish and Englishmen from the Manchester Regiment, Charles's efforts initially met with success. And they were making their way to London. However, a series of events forced the army to return to Scotland, where they were soon pursued by the British army and the two forces eventually met at Culloden on boggy terrain that made the Highland charge difficult and gave the larger and well-armed British forces the advantage. On April 16, 1746, the Jacobite forces of Charles Edward Stuart were devastatedly defeated by the Hanoverian forces commanded by William Augustus, Duke of Cumberland, near Inverness in the Scottish Highlands. That's a mouthful. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but they have such long titles. Yes. And then they have to announce all of them. All of whenever them. Whenever you yeah. meet them. The third. Esquire. I mean, it's just, it goes on and on and on. Oh, King James II? Oh, he's King James, like, the sixth or whatever in Scotland. So <laughs> he's King James II of England, but King James the sixth of Scotland. Oh, it's a whole long thing. I went yeah. way back on the Wikipedia page, like, who was before this guy and who was before uh, this guy? I got back to the Tudors, and then I don't know if I went even further. But I don't know if Wikipedia goes any further back than that. <laughs> Stop hitting next. <laughs> I am so stupid. Stupid, fascinated by this whole monarchy thing and just all of kind of European culture, but just like, well, how do you get to this name and that name and then this one if it's all supposed to be it's who you're related to, you know, it's not like they elected them. But it was surprising to me that to find out that they basically impeached a king and they were like, I don't like what you're doing. You got to get out of here. Get the fuck out. Yeah, but damn, having to remember all those names. I mean, like, what happens if you're like, yo, Kingsy, Kings, what's up? You know, just trying to be slick about it. Do they just like, off with his head? You have to, (laughs) all five names or you die. I mean, that's just... They could be that messed up. I'm certain of it. Certain monarchies, yeah. They just didn't like you. They would just kill you. (laughs) I want to go back to those days. I just... uh... (laughs) 
But you'd have to be somebody in power. You couldn't be like a I peasant know. or that would be like the end of it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would be the crazy peasant because I'd be like, off with her head. And they'd be like, this bitch crazy. <laughs> Lock her up. <laughs> <laughs> so back to this story. The Bonnie Prince is in Scotland. He's brought his forces, his Jacobite forces back with him. And then they're meeting with British forces on this terrible field. It's all marshy and everything. It's terrible for a fight for them, at least, because they're used to kind of like hand to hand combat type thing. Their artillery isn't as large as what the British have. So the battle lasted only an hour with the Jacobites suffering a bloody defeat between 1500 and 2,000 Jacobites were killed and wounded in the brief battle. In contrast, only about 300 government soldiers were killed or wounded. Some of these people went in naked. I mean, a 1,500 die compared to 300 on the other side. So either someone was heavily armed and the others were like, we got rocks. I mean, like, what the fuck, man? That's crazy. They had cannons, the British forces or Ah. English forces. They had cannons. They all had guns. They had cavalry. So the Jacobites, yes, they had swords or they had axes or something that they had to get close to you. That's right. You said hand-to-hand combat. Right. They did have some guns, but they were really new to it. Not many of them had used that. Yeah, they had some horses, but not everybody had horses. So, I mean, these were like your farmers taking up arms, you know, and this other was a real military force. Yeah, this is totally unfair, guys. I mean... Like, I just feel like showing up, like, totally unprepared and be like, can I call in sick to this? Because I don't see that this works out for me. (laughs) I mean... I think a lot of that kind of did happen. Yeah. They realized really quickly that this was a bad idea. And some of them did kind of peace out like the Bonnie Prince Charlie. He tried to fucking hide when it was time to even say like, whatever, forward march. He was like hiding somewhere. He's like, I'm a bush. (laughs) (laughs) You're supposed to be the commander of this whole thing. You want to come out and like say, let's go. This was your idea in the first place. Oh, that's such a boss. Such a boss, <laughs> isn't it? It's totally a boss move. Yeah, I'm going to sit this one out, guys. Sorry, I got emails or something over here behind this bush. I got to answer. <laughs> So following the battle, the Jacobites lowland units headed south towards Corybrow and made their way to Ruthven Barracks, while their highland units headed north towards Inverness and on through to Fort Augustus. The roughly 1,500 men who assembled at Ruthven Barracks received orders from Charles Edward Stewart to the effect that all was lost. Similar Mm. orders were received by the Highland units at Fort Augustus as well. By April 18th, the Jacobite army was disbanded. Officers and men of the units in the French service made their way to Inverness, where they surrendered as prisoners of war. The rest Mm. of the army broke up with men heading for home or attempting to escape abroad. The Bonnie Prince Charlie never returned to Scotland again. Wow. While in Venice, Cumberland emptied the jails that were full of people imprisoned by Jacobite supporters, replacing them with actual Jacobites. Lord Cumberland's official list of prisoners taken included 154 Jacobites and 222 French. I do air quotes because these French prisoners, they were actually a mix of countrymen. Like Lord Cumberland just kind of grouped them all together by saying foreign units in the service of the French. But it was a mix of some Englishmen, Irish and French people. Yeah, oh, okay. Prisoners were taken south to England to stand trial for high treason, and the Hanoverian victory at Culloden halted the Jacobite intent to overthrow the House of Hanover and restore the House of Stuart to the British throne. Mm. The battle and its aftermath was brutal. Efforts were made to further integrate the Scottish Highlands into the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Civil penalties were introduced to weaken the Gaelic culture and undermine the Scottish clan system. For example, anti-clothing measures were taken against Highland dress by an act of Parliament in 1746. 
The result was that wearing their tartan, the colors of their clan, usually worn on their kilts, but can be on other things as well, was banned except as a uniform for officers and soldiers in the British Army and later landmen, which is kind of just a type of like lord of an estate or something. Those lords and clan chiefs who had supported the Jacobite rebellion were stripped of their estate And these were then sold, and the profits were used to further trade and agriculture in Scotland. Mm. Today, a visitor center is located near the site of the battle. This center was first opened in December of 2007 with the intent of preserving the battlefield in a condition similar to how it was on April 16, 1746. But one big difference about the area, the way it currently looks compared to the way it looked back in 1746, 46 is that it is landscaped with Mm. you know cute little shrubberies and pretty heather plants while during the 18th century however the area was used as a common grazing ground mainly for tenants of the Culloden estate however efforts have been made for over a century to maintain the grounds and preserve its past Possibly the most recognizable feature of the battlefield today is the 20-foot-tall memorial erected by Duncan Forbes. Mm, That's my cousin. (laughs) (laughs) I'm related directly. This was back in 1881. That same year, he also erected headstones to mark the mass graves for the clans. Excellent. Wow. Now, each of these stones, they are placed in front of a mass grave. However, it is unknown to exactly who is buried in those mass graves. Sure. So the names on the stones are really just a representation of the people that were there and that had lost their lives. They got all the names? Yeah, they do. They have all the clans that were involved in this situation. They they put up the stones to recognize them for that and for their loss, not just for that day, but for what happened afterwards and that they lost kind of their whole way of life and everything. Yeah. There is a thatched roof farmhouse called Lenoch Castle. Nope, I almost said Castle. It's a cottage. (laughs) (laughs) That's my kind of castle. (laughs) That dates back to around 1760. It's located on the northeastern side of the battlefield. It serves as one of the last surviving examples of the simple story thatched buildings that were once common to the area. The small cottage stands alone today, but historical maps show that it did used to have a barn and like a stable next to it. They think the barn was was burnt down by the English because there were 30 wounded Jacobites that had taken refuge inside the barn, and that was their way of taking care of them. Wow, that's dark. Yeah. The cottage itself served as a field hospital for the government troops. The last occupant of Lenoch Cottage was Bella McDonald, who lived there until her death in 1912. Her family gave tours of the battlefield to whoever interested parties that came to visit. Just stop by. Yeah, well, I mean, like, this Victorian railway brought tourists to the highlands. Wow. It's kind okay. of a remote area, and it was bringing visitors to the area. They were like, what's up here? And they yeah, were right. like, well, we got this monument. Do you want to take a look at it? If they just get off the train, they're going to go stretch their legs. They're like, ooh, let's go see what this is. And and they're knocking at the door and they're like, hey, <laughs> lady, can you tell us a little bit about this monument you've got out in your yard? She pulls on her uh, mud boots and she's like, yeah, let's go for a walk. <laughs> yes, I mean, I was like doing the laundry, but whatever. Let's go. Right. A stone known as the English Stone is situated west of the cottage and is said to be the marker for the burial place of the government dead, the English. Mm, okay. Which actually, I should correct that because I found out that because they were in the area and there were Scottish individuals that did not want this rebellion. They did not want the Stuarts back on the throne or they just didn't want to be a part of the whole situation. And so they were in the army with the British. So it wasn't just English soldiers. It was Scottish and English individuals. Okay. Since 2001, the site of the battle has undergone topographical, geophysical, and metal detector surveys, in addition to a word I'm going to have a hard time saying. Archaeological, I guess. Yeah. Did I say that right? Okay. Yeah. Excavations. Is that right? Excavations, right? Better. I like the way you say it. (laughs) 
Anyways, they've really checked out this underneath, basically. They found some interesting things in the area where the fighting was the fiercest. For example, they found pistol balls and pieces of shattered muskets, which indicated close quarter fighting. Some appear to have been dropped without even being fired or missed their target, and others are distorted to show that they actually hit some kind of human body part. Oh. So many people in almost every comment that I found online, you know, not even paranormal people, just people that were just like on trip advisory. I went to this location. It was great. All these comments that I found, there's so many times I read that people shared the overwhelming feeling of sadness and a strange sense of silence. People noted that they never heard birds singing while there or seen them fly over. That's aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Nor do they see any kind of wildlife. Mm. Oddly enough, the Scottish clans believed in a figure that they called the Scree. Death is said to surely follow if they ever witness its presence. The Scree yeah. is described as a large black bird that rises up from the heather, screaming. The night before the battle, Lord George Murray and his men all claimed to see the Scree. The mm. bird practically blocked out the evening sky. It flew over the moor, giving off a shrieking caw. And then it just disappeared in mid-flight. Yeah, that doesn't usually happen. <laughs> <laughs> This, of course, didn't sit well with the clansmen, and matters were only made worse when other clansmen reported that near St. Mary's Well in the woods next to Culloden, that they witnessed the sight of a blood-soaked man that ran up to them with pure terror in his eyes. This man called out the word defeat. He yelled it twice with anguish in his voice and then just vanished before their eyes. Wow. They then heard distant drums and clashing of swords. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, wait, are we missing something? Did it start already? Did you have the wrong time? I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> weren't we supposed to be there at noon tomorrow? I know. <laughs> so what is happening, really? The sounds moved quickly upon them, and it was as if a ghostly army and battle passed right through their midst. Wow. The group had no way of knowing that this was an omen of their demise the next day in the battle. Well, not all of them, I guess, because somebody passed on this story. But oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. One eyed Willie style. <laughs> <laughs> The St. Mary's Well is said to be so haunted that the water screams with the voices of the restless dead. Damn, that's some interesting water. Can they <laughs> bottle that and ship it to the States? <laughs> I mean, I'd love to pass that out at work. <laughs> you thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> some very Harry Potter type shit. Wow. For a considerable time after the battle, locals were able to witness a repetition of the battle time and again. Many years after the battle, people walking across the moor found themselves in the very midst of the smoke and noise of fighting. On occasion, the dim form of a battle-weary Highlander has been seen at dusk close to the memorial, and this dark-haired warrior said to wear the red Stuart tartan has also been seen lying on the stones of the memorial as if resting. Yeah. He's right. tired. Or, yeah, he's a ghost. I bet he is tired. <laughs> His spirit is just like, damn, I'm still walking. Man. <laughs> yeah, there's several people that said that he seems confused. Yeah. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. I don't want to be a confused spirit. I suffer from enough confusion in my day to day <laughs> that to go on like that in my afterlife, that seems like... That's going to be a pain in the ass. Well, it's that painful kind of thing to realize, like from your flight story. Yeah. The American Airlines and the experiences that people right where the plane crash happened and that those people were confused and didn't confused. know what was going on. That's always sad to hear. Mm -hmm. The anniversary of the battle is said to be the most active time. Many people say that they've seen mysterious marching Highlanders, strange corpses, and bleeding mm -hmm. men. That they just Ooh. have flashes of these things. One lady said that she saw some like tartan laying a kilt basically on the ground and she went and she picked it up and underneath there was like a dead body. Oh, wow. And then it just poof, gone <laughs> after she said, 
Yeah, because he was all naked since she picked up his kilt. He's like, oh! <laughs> well, from my show, the kilt that he wears, it's so big, he's always like putting it over his shoulders and stuff too. Like he's got extra fabric to it that it's covering his bottom, but he's also like lifting up the back like a sweater to him and stuff too. So Two for one deal. Yeah. Oh. Like a whole jumper. Yeah. <laughs> well, they are back in style now too, so that's Jump, good. Wait, jumpers or kilts? Jumpers have come back. Oh, okay. I, I think kilts have never gone out. No. I think because it's so like, you know, crazy to see a dude in a skirt that it's just like, no, man, you can wear that whenever you want. It's <laughs> never going out of style. <laughs> whenever you wear that thing, go ahead, man, put it on. <laughs> <laughs> when I was trying to just soak in more and more stuff about this story, I was trying to find podcasts that they've done the story as well. I did find one and I will give her credit. And it's funny because it's the same lady from the Alaska episode that I did a couple of weeks ago. Oh, wow. And I didn't have her name, but I did listen to her podcast again. She's done Clodden as well. And it's called History Goes Bump ah. in the Night. And it's with Diane Student. That's her name. So she did Culloden and a lot of the stuff that she said, I had found that stuff already. So if you listen to her podcast and listen to ours, you're going to be like, you're copycatting her. <laughs> I'm not. I found the same shit online that she did too. That's all it is. <laughs> But I also found this other podcast that's about hiking. And they were interviewing a guy that was doing a lot of hiking in the Scottish Highlands. And I thought, I don't know, maybe he'll say something about passing some kind of haunted location. He didn't, by the no. way. <laughs> but there were lots of jokes about hiking in his kilt and stuff. So I thought, wow. yeah, I guess you would. Sure. If that was your jam all the time. Yeah, I guess so. So, I mean, does he like haul his bagpipes out there too and do like the whole nine <laughs> yards? Well, I mean, because that's. It's a lot to have to go through, but I mean, if you're committed. He was just normal hiking, really. The podcast was disappointing. Don't tell them that I said that. I'm sure they're not listening to this, but back to this story. Like I said, the anniversary is the most active time. A lot of people have witnessed the entire battle play out. I mean, where were these people's camera phones? <laughs> <laughs> you see something odd going on you're just gonna be like all right let's pop some popcorn we're just gonna hang out here for a while well what's interesting is that at the beginning the way that i read it online is it said for a considerable time after the battle now the battle happened in 1746 yeah. So was the energy more heightened afterwards? So these replays were happening more vividly and more frequently as the spirits were stronger. And then like as they passed on and kind of accepted what happened, they dissipate and you don't get that. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. But it is said that the most haunting ghost of Culloden Moor is a tall, lonely, wandering figure that whispers, defeat it, defeat it. Oh, Just yeah. Over this is and the over guy again. that disappears then afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. Oh. I think they're the same guy, though they're told in separate counts. But I think it's the same guy. It sounds kind of sad. A Brian Wilkins posted that during his time at Culloden Moor, the energy was so overwhelming, like a heavy feeling on his chest, that he wasn't even comfortable approaching Lenuk Cottage. Mm. And as they continued to try to reach the cottage to overcome that feeling, he then heard gunfire. And he was like, yep, never mind. We just yeah. won't do that. Mm -hmm. There was a bad feeling there for a reason. Yes. He felt as if it was telling him, don't go any further. And so they just didn't after that. Another visitor, Lois, don't have her last name. She posted that she and her husband were at the visitor center and they were viewing a movie that they play there mm. about the history. And throughout the movie, someone or something kept kicking the back of her seat. Oh, don't you hate that shit? She assumed that it was these children that she had seen while they were waiting on the movie to start that were playing with like some clothes, period piece clothing that is within the museum meant for children to kind of play with. So mm -hmm. she thought, oh, it's just those children. And then as soon as the lights came on after the movie, she looks behind her just, I guess, to check it out or to see their faces or give them the stank to, eye. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to say, to glare at them angrily. <laughs> Look at their parents <laughs> like, didn't you know this was happening? Right. How could you let this happen? Yeah, nobody was there. There was nobody behind her. Oh, that's when I would go, rats! <laughs> <laughs> I know, you would kind of think like, well, what the fuck was that? Well, they go out and then they start touring the battlefield and walking by the monuments and everything. And then she felt a tug on her pant leg. And so she's like, what the hell is this? 
So she goes and she asks questions and she kind of researches it more. And then she found out that there were reports that whole families, women and children, were murdered within the area following the battle. Damn. A lot of them, their husbands had went off to this battle and there was nobody there left to defend them. Oh, man. So she found out that there were rumors that children also haunt the grounds. This was the only report that I found saying that children haunt the grounds was from her. Oh, that's weird. Paranormal investigators have reported mysterious cold spots in places where Jacobites fell in large numbers. Andrea Byron of Scottish Paranormal took a team of investigators onto Culloden Moor and experienced dramatic temperature and humidity fluctuations near the graves. Mm. Then they also conducted interviews with the staff of the visitor center who claimed that they hear disembodied voices throughout the battlefield and have received many reports from visitors and locals who claim to also hear these same disembodied voices that they say sound like battle type noises. Okay, okay. The visitor center once even had two local women come in and ask questions about the route taken the night before the battle as the Jacobite army had made an attempt to surprise attack the English. They knew they were outnumbered and they had these cannons and all this stuff. So they saw if we could surprise attack them, then we'll have an advantage. Well, however, they weren't that familiar with the area and they got lost in the dark Damn. And, like there were several units and they got separated. And so most of them retreated back to Culloden and then okay. just kind of gave up. <laughs> the women were amazed when the employees at the visitor center showed them a map of the route and their houses were smack dab in the middle of it. Wow. The women for the past 10 years had experienced at least five times being woken up in the early morning hours of the sounds of marching outside. Wow. They always run to the window and look out what's going on and they see nothing. Yet they still hear the marching. Wow. That's kind of trippy. It is. But they're also getting woke up at night. So it's like, God damn, <laughs> man. I just want a good night's sleep. What the hell? It's like a 3 a.m. wake up too. So yeah, it's like when shit. you're like, fuck, my alarm is going to go off in just another I know. couple of hours. No, <laughs> I know. Now I got to try and go back to sleep. Could you keep it down out there with the marching? Jeez. I'm sure by like the third time, that's how they reacted to it. <laughs> <laughs> Putting the pillow over their head. Ah, these noisy ass ghosts. So other people nearby have also reported spirits marching through their yards while tourists regularly run into spectral soldiers. Wow. Most psychics who visit claim that the activity is all residual, which makes sense. Yeah. Just replaying events of that time. Even if none of these activities are intelligent, it seems that it definitely exists and it is still very active as so many people have had experiences. Yeah. And some other paranormal groups have been able to capture EVPs and spirit box responses that would challenge the idea that the activity is residual. Mm. One of those teams is called Paranormal Hauntings which investigated the grounds with team members Chrissy and Dave Rising. They posted their investigation live on Facebook April 16th, 2019, so just last year. Yeah. It was also the evening of the anniversary of the battle. They used an app called Afterlife. As Chrissy and Dave stood right next to the memorial monument and Chrissy had just laid down some flowers out of respect, the app produced the word English. Mm. And then after that, they received the word monument. The Facebook live video is like two hours long. You could totally watch it. There's activity going on throughout. They've got several responses from this app that they're using, though most seem random not really in response to their questions, but some did seem to relate to what the investigators were saying or their surroundings, such as they ask, have you got a message for people who may be watching who are related or descendants? And the reply was, we are resting. So that seems like a decent answer, right? 
Yeah. Could be a random statement, but it could also be a response. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the Facebook Live, the word Heather even came through, which is the plant that covers most of the field. Yeah. It's a ground covering style bush with uh, little purple flowers. Have you seen it before? Yeah. Well, in the videos. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen Heather. Like we have some purple bushes here that look a lot like it, but I don't mm -hmm. know that for sure that it's Heather. Like would we have the same plants growing like where I live and where they live? I don't think so. I have to look at it. My mom used to use it a lot in her gardening. You know, my mom was a landscaper and she had lined both sides of the driveway in Heather. I mean, it was one of her favorite bushes. So obviously every time you bring it up, I get an idea of what it was that she used a lot in her landscaping. Well, that is quite interesting because during this Facebook Live, they had someone comment that they had picked some Heather from the moor and that person believed that that Heather brought them nothing but bad luck afterward. There you go, right? No, it's probably because of the location wow. <laughs> and not the plant itself. But it is strange because that whole scree thing mm -hmm. also comes out of the Heather. Right, exactly. Yeah. How strange. It's gone now, so it's not at my parents' house anymore. <laughs> <laughs> My dad totally Good. redesigned all of that. <laughs> The word that seemed to come through the most during their investigation was remembered. Mm. Another interesting thing was that Chrissy said she saw a horse-like apparition. She said that she saw the head of a horse, like, go by on the road that wasn't far from them. And then they later researched it because this was not a claim that they were aware of beforehand. But she later researched it and found that several other people had said that they had seen ghost horses also mm. on the the battlefield. Wow. So I have their link to their live investigation, I would call it that, that we will share on social cool. media so that you can see it. Also, there was another paranormal group that I watched their investigation. They are called Scottish Ghost Adventures. So oh, of course cute. I was like, what's this about? Yeah. <laughs> is there a Zach, Nick, and Aaron? Um, oh. <laughs> there isn't. There's a Colin. <laughs> Mark and Greg. And that's not even like the whole group. Greg is just their friend. Colin, Connor, Mark, Connor, their brothers, they are a part of the group. And then Greg was like a guest investigator for the evening at Culloden Moor. While they were filming, they got the sound of cannon fire. Like you can kind of hear it too. It's kind of oh. cool. I mean, I guess you don't know the area. So you don't know. Oh, that could have been a car backfiring from that neighborhood down the street. But <laughs> <laughs> there is this sound and they were like, what's that? Is that cannon fire? And you're like, oh my God, it does. It could sound like that, I guess. Wow. Yeah. And while investigating Ruthven barracks, which are nearby, and it's where some of the Highlanders had retreated to, they received a growl while oh. they were in one of the prison cells. Mm. And while they were also in one of these prison cells, I saw, I don't even think they talked about it. So maybe I was seeing things or maybe I'm forgetting that they did talk about it. I can't remember. But <laughs> I saw several times these light anomalies that didn't make any sense. It's fucking cold. It should not be a bug. It didn't move like a bug. I mean, yes, it's dirty and there's dirt particles in the air. This is an open space, basically. It's not enclosed mm -hmm. anymore, like, because it's ruins almost. Yeah. But it just didn't move like dust or bugs to me. It was interesting. And I honestly, at this point, can't remember if they noted it or if I was just obsessing about it. Well, they might not have. They might be under the impression that people might question it too much. So they might have not mentioned anything about it. But it's interesting that you saw it and pointed it out. So, I mean, that might help give them the validity on whatever it was that they would have seen and they're like see Colin I told you to leave it in <laughs> jeez <laughs> They also got hit on a K2 meter. They were using like two K2 meters and they had put them down on like a ledge. And then the investigators down in this prison cell, it's kind of like in like a little thing. I don't know. He has to go down into it and then he has to climb out of it to get out of this prison cell. Oh, but wow. As he's climbing out of this prison cell, that's when he gets a hit on the K2 meter because it's always like ghosts to right as you're like trying to leave. That they're yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> actually, I was here the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're leaving? That's too bad. I had so much to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Oh, you coming back? That's cool. I have to go to the bathroom now. <laughs> Why do you play with my emotions, ghost? Not cool. All the time. <laughs> 
So, and they had actually used an actual spirit box, not like one of the apps, a spirit box like we have. Oh. And they had gotten several responses like throughout the whole night. But the only ones that really came through clear to me were the words emotion, loss, and the name Michael. And they got these all at different random times as they were moving throughout all of Culloden Moor. But that didn't come into response of like any questions they were asking either. You know, they're like, is anybody here? And they're like, emotions. What? <laughs> <laughs> emotions are here? Yes. We should talk about those. You know, it, it didn't seem to be intelligent, but it was the clearest words that came through. Yeah. Lastly, I found a photo that psychic Christine. Duncan. Yep. <laughs> you have been here. This, this whole time I'm listening to the story, I'm like, how does she not know that I was there? <laughs> Her name is Christine Hamlet. She took a photo while walking on Culloden Moor. And within the photo, Christine claims to see a figure similar to the liking of the actor Sam Hewen. He's a character on out. He's the main lead character on Outlander. No way. It just so happens to be like, it's so weird. This apparition looks just like you. She's doing the same shit that we would do. Where we're like, hashtag Josh Gates. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a ghost that looks just like Josh Gates. So weird. Oh my God. I, I never even thought about that's what she was trying to do. Now, Christine is no stranger to contacting the spirits, having co-presented the TV program Rescue Mediums. From 2006 to 2007, but Christine said that she was taken aback by the sighting. She believes that the Highlands are a haven for the supernatural, and she plans to document all her photos that she took of the spooky beings in her upcoming book. But I sent you the photo. That's the actor in that little lower thing. Yeah. And then right. that's what she thinks is a ghost in that window. Okay. So this is a window looking into something or looking out of something? Yes. As far as I know, this is a window looking into that Lenuk cottage. Okay. So yeah, I guess I can kind of see where there's a figure profile, a human profile. To me, he looks like he's wearing a hat. It looks like a goth hat. It looks like if I'm going to suggest that it's a side profile, it would be more of like a bowl cut hair style. Uh, it does not look like the guy below because I don't see any features. No, whatsoever. Not at all. So you're right. She just wanted to hashtag <laughs> Sam Hewen. But it's funny because it does look like are there like bars on this window maybe to keep people from breaking into it or something? Because no, yeah, there's like a I think that's just the way the window is made. Like I lived in a house that had like the original windows. Now it was like an 80s house. Yeah. But it had like these framed out really cool windows. And, but it's just clear glass. It's not like a colored glass or stained glass or anything like that. Yeah, just a clear glass. From the 1700s, I mean, a lot of times that the glass that I've seen has been like, I'd have to, I guess, see like a side by side of the actual window. But a lot of times I've seen where it's like, it's got these indentures of like circular patterns in the window. And I don't know if that's just blemishes in the glass from back in the day because they yeah. didn't have a, a clear way of actually straightening it out. But I've seen those blemishes. So it's a weird picture. I can see where you would look at this and see a side profile. But again, without having the actual window there to s compare it to, I mean, and honestly, too, if it's someone from the side profile, like I could actually see like a hand going up to this mouth. Like he's oh, yeah. like, hmm. That or like, <laughs> I was thinking like a pipe in his mouth or something. Yeah, too. Right? There's definitely yeah. something coming from the mouth. I mean, it looks yeah. nothing like the actor she's trying to claim it looks like. That's funny. She's like, I saw a ghost. It looks just like you. That's <laughs> a stretch. Hashtag love you. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Hashtag love you. Call me. <laughs> but yeah, no, she's totally full of shit basically. <laughs> but it could be an apparition, I guess. The photo is just so weird because it's obviously, it's either taken with a, like a night vision camera or right. she's washed all the color out. So if she's washed the color out, then she's fucked with the photo. Then I don't really trust it. And, but if it's a night vision camera, then I get it. Yeah. Yeah. It could be like negative. It does almost look like she used a filter. Oh yeah. That too. Yeah. So she also took this other one. I'm going to send you. It doesn't look like any actor. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like anything. 
Oh. It's just interesting, apparently. That's fucking Bigfoot. <laughs> I've seen the I'm same picture. Gumby, but... <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that is a weird photo. What's the story behind this thing? There is no story. And she just, <laughs> she just ran with the Outlander lead star thing. And she didn't explain this one at all. And this one is actually probably more interesting to me. I'd like to know more about this one. I couldn't find it, though. I would assume it looks, like I said, she's using that kind of wacky night vision camera. So it's hard to tell. It might be in front of just a wooded vegetation of some kind. But I think that it could be in front of that cottage still. The stone on the outside, the way it looks rough, and that she got this like shadow. So if she got a shadow while taking a photo simply of a building, this would be interesting. But yeah. again, we have to kind of, I guess we have to buy her book to find out the full story. Oh, that's what, so can you find pictures of the cottage online? Oh, yes. Okay. And for a while, they shut it down because it needed repair. And I think that's kind of when they built the new visitor center. But now they've reopened it as well. So you can even get pictures on the inside and everything. Well, you know how much I do enjoy scouting for and buying books. So I might have <laughs> to buy this one. Well, she seems like a cool chick and she's trying to actively investigate things. Right. And you can see why she's trying to say, oh, I see a ghost. It looks like this actor. You know, she's trying to get those people's attention. And it worked, I think, for the most part for her. Good. Well, that gives us hope. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we have to start doing on our next investigations. Mm -hmm. It looks just like Zach Bagans. <laughs> <laughs> Look, don't you see the resemblance? <laughs> we better start off with Nick or something. Just to, <laughs> somebody that might actually care. Somebody that needs it. Yeah. Mm, do I edit that out? <laughs> no. Hashtag Nick Roth. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag we, we love, you. love you. No matter what you're going through. And we do. We support you, man. We remember how you used to be. And we'll be in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag we're inviting you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so to wrap this thing up, if that is not enough paranormal for you, just remember the Rufin Barracks, they're haunted as well. So you can go and explore those some more because that's what that other paranormal group did. And I did see a lot of other people getting EVPs out of that location. You can tour it during the day. And then it seems like you can just walk into these places at night as well. <gasps> also, the Culloden House, which is a hotel now, but was a, you know, grand estate then. It was where Bonnie Prince Charlie stayed. It is said to be haunted by him, though huh. he didn't die there or anything. Just that kind of residual emotion of him pacing the night before the battle. I didn't actually find any evidence of people saying that they had paranormal experiences from this place. But also just it's a place that you can stay if you ever want to visit the area. That's nice. So keep in mind when visiting the site as a paranormal investigator, this location is not only a battlefield, it is a place of pilgrimage for people. For many visitors, this is a graveyard of their ancestors and should be respected as so. Remember mm -hmm. to bring an offering, such as flowers, coins, or other meaningful tokens. Remember to thank any supernatural beings you may encounter for their time and service. And oh. then be sure to write us and tell us about your experience if you have one of those <laughs> at creatures of the night paranormal at gmail.com or you can find us on social media under cotn underscore paranormal on instagram and cotn paranormal on facebook and twitter you can dm us there or you can just comment on any of the posts that we put out on this subject yes We'll be posting this interesting celebrity shot Christine took along with gorgeous pictures of Culloden throughout the week, along with other interesting paranormal stuff. If you are into those pagan ways, you can also follow our shop, The Spirit Emporium. It also has its own social media on all those places, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And it's just The Spirit Emporium, right? Yeah, it's just The Spirit Emporium. And then we're also on Etsy, or you can shop our website, creaturesthenightparanormal.com. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I've got for you. I mean, I've got to get back to watching Outlander, like I said, <laughs> so I can get caught up. So thanks for listening. 
And I don't know. Do you want to add anything? I fucking loved that. That was a history lesson. That's for sure. Um, I've never looked into anything in Scotland and I should because that's like my husband's heritage. So <laughs> yeah, I should have. But you know, I'm all about me. So I'm like Polish. What? <laughs> I don't ever look at it. So thank you for actually researching that and giving that to me. It's like a little present to me and I could tell him all about it and maybe enlighten him a little bit. But I think it's badass. You know, I, I teased earlier and I'm just like, this lady, she's so adorable for uh, saying it looks like dude, but man, she's uh, marketing. Let's talk about like, yes, <laughs> she's a she's genius. I didn't realize how powerful that could be yeah. until you kind of pointed that out. I really do appreciate that. She's opened the door for us. So we're going to start doing that too. We're just going to follow her lead. <laughs> Every ghost we find looks like a celebrity. <laughs> be like, well, who was that lady that wanted to go and touch the Dybbuk box? Uh, Cardi B. Oh, yeah. So next one be like, oh, Cardi B, we found your like ghost girlfriend. Don't you want to come out here to Boston and check this shit out? And she'll be on the next Ellen DeGeneres show being like, oh, yes. I've got to <laughs> check this out. I've got to because it's haunted. I got to <laughs> check it out. <laughs> I love it. We're going to follow her lead. That was a very, very epic story. There's a lot going on there. And the whole defeated, defeated. That I mean, that just like, that kind of goes all over me. Like I just... It gives me chills. Like there is somebody out there that is still struggling to realize what happened and they're confused and they're lost and the poor guy hasn't been able to rest. It's sad. It's sad. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. It's devastating to read. And then it's amazing. It really was amazing. Like I went to all these websites, you you know, you type in Claude Moore ghost and then mm, I mean, like these paranormal groups websites don't pop up. It's all these historical sites and they're like the ghosts of the past. And they're just mm -hmm. talking about remembering those people, basically. Right. They're not talking about actual paranormal evidence, what I'm looking for. Right. But you look at the comments after these blogs and articles and all of them were like, I was just there last year, last month, four years ago, whatever. They say it was so strange. It was so quiet. It was so eerie. That is strange. It, all of them. These are not people that are into the paranormal necessarily. They weren't on websites that were for that. And then they would say, I was incredibly sad while I was there. And and, you know, I noticed the weird silence that was going on. Yeah, that's weird. You know, because they're going there basically just for the historic value mm -hmm. or because of an ancestry thing, like you said. Yeah. And when they go and they notice these very strange encounters that they're going to go on, back on media and say, yeah, I went. And it's weird. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a first person encounter that you don't expect because they're not even investigating the paranormal. They're just there for, like I said, the historic value or because of their ancestry. So that's heavy. You know, there's a lot of weight to it. And those are the kind of things that you love to encounter because, you know, we're just exploring the paranormal. We go to the places that are already haunted. We know we've, we've done the research. It's haunted. It's got ghosts. Let's go. Let's lock it down. Let's stay there the night. Let's investigate just the paranormal. Yeah, we got the history. Fine, fine, fine. That helps us to communicate with who whoever's there. But these are regular people that aren't expecting that sort of thing. So it's um, it's a little different. Yeah. And they know this is odd. Uh -huh. You know, I don't know. I've never looked into it yet. Um, I imagine one day we'll cover it. But like, do people go to Gettysburg and have the same experience? Do they have these <gasps> odd like, wow, this is weird. It's quiet. It's very somber. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like the thing is with the Scottish Highlands, like, so a lot of Scotland had integrated into like this more modern environment, much like the English, but the Highlands were kind of remote and they were still in their clan ways. And the English were encroaching on them and they were forcing them to kind of change. Mm -hmm. And after this battle, it was kind of the end of that. You know, they had went against them and it come in a, an aggressive manner. So now the English had this right to say, oh, you fucked up. You were a wow. rebel. You were crazy. So now we get to enforce these laws. Now you don't get to have your uh, bagpipes. I didn't tell you. They took those away from them, too. <laughs> They weren't Damn. allowed to play those. That was on Diane's student show. I didn't actually see that. So oh, she might have made it up. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> she, they couldn't wear their clothes. They couldn't play their bagpipes. They couldn't speak their language. We all know uh, that. Yeah. I mean, like their whole culture ended with this. So, you know, maybe it's a bit more devastating. It is. I did think of Gettysburg when you uh, talked about hearing the uh, ghostly cannon sound yeah. or whatever. You know, I was like, oh, that sounds like Gettysburg. Of course, I didn't mention it, but it's funny that you brought it up. Yeah. I mean, you hear that with a lot of battlefields and Gettysburgs. I mean, like Gettysburg, the I think I said it even stupider the second time. Gettysburg. 
<laughs> it's said to have all these kind of residual like noises and haunts, but the overwhelming feeling that a lot of people get from this place is probably the most powerful paranormal thing that comes from there, that everybody walks away with the same kind of somber feeling. It's not likely that every person on this world shares the same emotions, you know, and then they yeah. go there and they do. That's interesting. Yeah, you're not going to watch DJ and Steve get engaged and cry like a baby like I am. But if we both go to this memorial and we both feel sad about it, then yeah. that's a connection <laughs> between people. I look over and I have to continue ugly crying because I'm crying <laughs> and you can clearly see me. So I'm like, I have to go full force with it. <laughs> Just remember, that's my technique. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was an interesting location. And like I said, it came from my dirty stories, basically. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm I'm glad that was there for you because I wouldn't have known about this location. That's cool. I love the stuff that is historically based, but it's got that little bit of soft spot for me with the romance and whatnot. So, and I didn't know anything about this whole battle and this situation until watching that show. So thanks TV. Yeah, I told you it's not all bad. As Wendy shakes her finger at me fiercely. (laughs) Y'all think I'm getting my facts from the wrong people, but I learned some shit. I got it. That's awesome. I loved your story. I thought it was very historic and I got my lesson in tonight. So hopefully you don't quiz me on it later, but I think I'll get the paranormal stuff correct. It's just there was a lot of names thrown at me all at once and I didn't write anything down because I'm like uh, listening very intently. Well. (laughs) You're going to lose a Jeopardy <laughs> when I'm winning. <laughs> that's okay. All right. I guess that's it. We got to, I got to go watch some TV. So cool. I got to eat some nachos. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.